Okay, this lecture is about general immune response and pathology of viruses. So we're going to start by talking about types of virus infections. Um, I'm going to throw in here some techniques for quantitating or quantifying viruses. Um, because in order to know where you are in a virus infection, in case we were monitoring you, we'd need to know how much virus you have. And then we'll talk, which we've talked before, um, about the innate and adaptive immune response very briefly and the interferon immune response to viruses. Immunology is not my strength. I've never had a class in it and um, I kind of pick up information as I go. So if you are lucky enough, lucky enough to have taken immunology, an immunology course, um, you're going to know way more than me. So the type of virus infection you have is a combination between the virus that's infecting you, your health, so how good is your immune system to respond, and the host cell. So what cells are this is this virus coming into contact with? So again, remember we've talked about, um, this is called tissue tropism, and we've talked about the connection with transmission, right? So the virus has to get to the cells that it can productively infect. Okay. Viruses can have different pathological and different immune responses based on the types of host cells that they infect. So here are the types of virus infections that we are, are talking about. And again, in this class, we're focusing on animal viruses. Um, there are very cool viruses that infect um, plants and viruses, obviously, that infect bacteria, the phages, and viruses that infect amoebas. And in fact, every cell type, like organism type, I should say, that we have looked at as scientists, they have found a virus that infects it. So yes, there are viruses that infect um, insects and worms and any kind of living organism um, you can think of. I want you to also remember that the symptoms of a virus infection is a combination of the type of infection you are experiencing, what the cell, what I'm sorry, what the virus does to the cell. We're going to talk about that a little bit, so a little bit about the pathology and your immune response. So the first type of virus infection, which is most common, is called the acute infection. And it causes something that we call CPE or cytopathic effects. So the challenge with viruses is in order to grow viruses and study them in the lab, you use either tissue culture, which is basically your Petri dish with cells that the virus can infect, um, or you use an animal model. So to study what a virus does to a cell, to be able to visualize it, you have to use tissue culture. And this is pretty artificial, right? It's one type of cell um, grown up, and this is called a monolayer. So you can see all the cells are touching each other. Um, the white outlines are showing you the outlines of the cells. Um, and the cells will go and infect, and you can see in this case, um, after about five and a half hours, some cells are starting to round up. This is called the cytopathic effect. After eight hours, you see lots of rounding. And after 24 hours, you're seeing some clumping, but you're also seeing sp uh, space, which means the cells have died, uh, most likely through apoptosis um, or have just lysed, um, been dead. 
our cells don't grow this way in our body. Um, yes, we have nice layers of skin cells and other types of cells, but this is pretty artificial. If you're looking at an animal model, right, you can't look at a virus infection in real time. You have to sacrifice the animal. You have to um, harvest the tissue, slice it up, stain it, look at it under the microscope. Um, so it's a challenge to look at um, what a virus does to cells. Uh, the other thing I almost forgot to mention is with tissue culture, this is really artificial because there is no immune response, right? Like I said, it's a single cell type. Um, so with an animal model, at least you can see a more realistic um, organismal reaction to a virus infection. Cytopathic effect basically means cell death. So remember that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. So here's that word parasite, and that's telling you that it doesn't do anything good for the cell. As much as I love viruses, um, there are no really naturally good for us um, viruses, at least specifically for our cells. Um, we have figured out ways to use viruses, um, and that will be the final lecture on um, viruses and bi biotechnology. Um, but viruses cause cell death um, in the host that um, they infect. They can cause cell death by lysis, right? So bursting of the cell. They can cause cell death by apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So there's signals that say, hey, you're infected. Um, you need to die. And viruses can also change cell physiology so the cells are not acting, responding like they normally would. In an acute affection, inf affection, infection, the end result is that we clear the virus infection. It's acute, it's short-lived. Right, so your immune system is going to um, respond, clear out the virus infection, you're no longer infected, okay? You still get cytopathic effects because it takes some time for the immune response, the immune system to respond. There are two um, types of virus infections that don't cause any issues. Um, the null infection is when a virus um, encounters a cell without the proper receptor. So there's really no infection at all. I don't know why we have to define null infections, but we do. Okay, so this again, think about tissue tropism, right? You could have a virus floating throughout your bloodstream throughout your lymph nodes, in your respiratory system, if the cells don't have, or they are not expressing the correct receptor, there is not going to be an infection. An abortive infection means that the host cell is lacking some specific proteins the virus needs. which means the virus cannot replicate. So these are both non-productive infections. Okay. So this is um, important to think about when you've been looking up your virus receptor, you may have found that it's a very general, so some kind of glycosaminoglycan or um, sulfate or, or um, sialic acid, something that seems very common, not a specific type of receptor. So the virus may actually be able to get into multiple cell types, but 
The virus, remember, relies on, it's an intercellular parasite, relies on the host cell for a lot of the proteins that it needs for biosynthesis, so for genome replication and for producing viral proteins. And if the host cell doesn't express that protein, then you're going to have this non-productive, abortive, um, it's also called non-permissive infection. So trying to throw a lot of these words out there so that as you read in the literature, you'll understand what they're talking about. All right, so we have acute infection. In infection, why do I keep calling that? Acute infection, right? Most of the time we get um, the cold or we get the flu um, or we're exposed to other viruses, our immune system can clear it. Viruses can also have non-productive infections. They get in there, they can't find the right cells to infect. Then we have a different kind of infection, which is um, a much more long-term. So acute is very short term. These are long term infections. And we have um, two categories, persistent and latent. And I will tell you, many times these terms are used together or sometimes used interchangeably. Um, but I want you to understand what I see as um, the difference. So here we talked about acute. Oh, another good one, stomach flu right, if you get a viral infection in your stomach. So you have an infection, um, in blue is virus production, Let's see if I can make a blue, blue is virus production, and the little um, bars are kind of showing you the peaks of uh, infection. Okay. Latent means that the virus can have reoccurring infections. So you've never cleared it. The virus is hanging out, but there are definitely times uh, I sometimes hit now oh, I hit a so I have some good interesting um, links. I just wish they wouldn't pop up while I'm lecturing. Um, times of no virus production. So to me, this is the big difference between latent and persistent. So latent, these viruses kind of go dormant. So all of these herpes viruses, um, herpes virus simplex 1, Epstein-Barr virus, Varicella zoster virus, the chickenpox virus, cytomegalovirus, all of these are latent viruses, right? And if you've ever had cold sores, you know all about this. You can get an outbreak of cold sores, and then you have nothing. So your immune system kind of clears it, but the virus is still hanging out in some of your cells. And then you have a reoccurring infection, and it clears, and it goes on and on. And don't ask me why there's no little orange bar here. I'm not sure. In contrast, a persistent infection means that there's continuous production of infectious virus. Okay, can be very, very low level. Okay, so they're defining persistent asymptomatic as something that you're always producing a little bit of virus, but you're really not having any disease. And that's really what the, the orange here is showing, some kind of infection, active infection. Persistent pathogenic is similar to latent. So I've seen HIV called both latent and persistent. Um, but the difference is there are, you're always making a little bit of virus in persistent infections. And then sometimes you have these reoccurring bursts of um, viral production. Latency is really interesting and affects many of us. Um, so again, this is herpes simplex virus one cold sores. Um, these little bubbles um, of virus producing factories there. Um, and this is just showing you the timeline. So you have an acute infection. You first 
get kind of inoculated. And you now have this virus with you forever. Okay. That's the same with HIV. You are infected forever. Yes, there have been a few cases that they have said they've cured HIV. Those are by extreme measures and anonymal, anonymous ways. Yeah, rare. Um, so we're going to talk about the more common. The latent infection means your immune system has control over this virus infection, so you're not getting an outbreak of cold sores. But for some reason, you get reactivation, immunosuppression. So they say cold sores are stimulated by the UV in the sun, um, stress, hormones. Um, I would pretty consistently get one to two outbreaks um, on my lips every year, same exact spot. Um, because as I'll show you, these herpes viruses um, live back in the, the roots of your nerves. So you get an outbreak, um, a, acute or sometimes subclinical, so sometimes you don't know. The immune system takes back over, the virus is tapped down. An uh, interesting, um, um, what do I want to say? example of a latent virus is varicella zoster, which I'm just going to put is the chickenpox, slash shingles virus. So, used to be kids would get infected with chickenpox, and that's what it looks like down here. Um, you would pretty much clear it, but the virus hangs out in the roots of some of these nerves. So this is your acute stage. And then, as you get older, you could get zoster. And zoster is usually in uh, a single area, like this strip, because the virus is hanging out in the nerves that control this tissue. right? So it doesn't go all over, like the chicken pox, but it's wherever those viruses decided to stay latent. As we get older, our immune system um, gets more depressed, and so we can have these shingles outbreaks. So chicken pox and shingles, varicella zoster, single virus, VZV, two different um, diseases or symptoms. What's super interesting, I think, is that, and I've mentioned this before in the vaccine video, that the chickenpox vaccine, the varicella vaccine, is a live attenuated virus, which means that you have the potential of getting shingles from the vaccine later in life because they gave you this live virus to protect you against chickenpox. Again, the inactivated virus must not give a strong enough immune response, um, and that's why they use a live live attenuated one. So, just because you got the chicken pox vaccine doesn't mean you will never get shingles. So we have this different shingles vaccine that they recommend for people, I think it's 60 or 65 and older. Okay, so we've had acute, we've had basically the non-permissive, um, null and abortive, We've had persistent and latent, ones that hang around and can be reactivated. And then there are also transforming viruses. Transforming viruses can be precancerous or just cancerous. So what they're doing is they're changing the virus is changing cell properties which result in uncontrolled cell division which is basically the definition of cancer. So what this is trying to show you is here's a normal cell was infected by a transforming virus and instead of the cells staying in a nice monolayer like I showed you in a previous slide they start to clump so they start to grow out of control, they're not following the correct signaling, um, and this is 
uh, can lead to cancer or it could lead to benign um, tumors as well. And what's happening is the virus genome or parts remain in the cell. So some viral genomes can actually integrate into the host genome so it becomes part of the host chromosome. So it's part of you forever, right? This is true of HIV. Um, some, especially the herpes types of viruses, remain as an episome. An episome is a circular uh, chromosome, viral chromosome. So like Epstein-Barr virus um, does this. A lot of the herpes viruses do. Um, so the viral chromosome is there. It replicates every time the cell replicates. Um, and some of the genes that are expressed can transform the cell um, into this rapidly dividing cell. I also mentioned parts of the genome, um, and we will talk about HPV. And HPV, we think that um, part of the genome integrates into the host, but it's no longer able to prevent, uh, sorry, to produce viruses. It's now defective, but it produces these proteins that tell the cell to keep dividing. So here's just a list of some of the tumor or transforming viruses. We'll talk about human papillomavirus. Um, some of you are doing um, hepatitis B and hepatitis C um, and Epstein-Barr virus. So now I wanna switch gears for a second and talk about some of the techniques for quantifying viruses because you're going to come across these in some of the papers. And to know that you have a virus infection, somehow we have to be able to, to tell, right? We don't normally um, do this, so if you go in for a sore throat, they'll swab your throat, see if it's a bacterial infection. We don't do a lot of this for viral infections because we don't have a lot of antivirals. And it's kind of like, okay, you have a virus infection, so what, you got to just hang out until your immune system clears it. But in the lab, we have techniques for quantifying viruses. I've talked about this one previously, a plaque assay. And so a plaque is a cleared area, which means no cells, due to virus cytopathic effects. So this 1A is showing you this nice monolayer. All the purple are the nuclei, and you can kind of see the cytoplasm of all these cells, and they're in a nice monolayer, and they're growing together, and da 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 cells. You can infect with virus, say here, virus reproduces, kills that cell, goes on to kill neighboring cells, and goes on to kill neighboring cells, and so you get this clearing. What these plaques look like as is R is as R <laughs> empty spaces. Okay. So this is bacteria with a phage infection. Okay. So hopefully you can kind of see it's kind of cloudy out here, and then there are these circles of clearing. And each plaque represents one virus. So one virus has gotten in there, it's replicated, it's spread, it's killed the neighbors, it's spread, it's killed the neighbors. So you definitely have to do dilutions. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but if you get the right dilution where you have these nice isolated plaques, you can count the number of plaques and you can quantitate the number of viruses. So here are eukaryotic cells. With eukaryotic cells, what we do is we grow that nice monolayer in your petri dish and we put a thin layer of auger on top, just like you used in microbiology to grow bacteria, because that allows the virus to only go to its neighbors. Then we remove the auger and we stain all the cells with a purple stain. 
and I'll show you that in a second. And that lets us know where the clearings are. You can do plaque assays on plants. So every single dot is a plaque. It's showing cell death in that little region. Okay. So the key to doing a plaque assay for quantification is to do a series of dilutions where you get nice individual plaques. So again, this is eukaryotic cells. Um, the staining is purple. Um, the hardest thing with these plaque assays is to get um, one, a nice monolayer, and two, to get the um, layer of auger on without scraping off some of the cells. So um, <laughs> this is a lot of background noise. Doesn't mean these are uninfected. Doesn't mean there was any, um, or sorry, these are uninfected virus there. Um, but when you pull off that auger layer, sometimes you pull off um, cells with it and it makes your, your plaque assay not so pretty. But what you want to be able to do is go through and count the individual plaques to quantitate the amount of virus you have. Another technique for quantifying viruses is ELISA. Okay. So ELISA stands for Enzyme Linked Immunosorbent Mint assay. Anytime you see the word immuno means antibody. So this is an assay, a method of quantitating that requires antibodies. So this is sometimes why ELISAs aren't used. Antibodies can be expensive and if you're looking at um, a more rare virus you might not have an antibody to it. But in general the way this works is you have an antibody to the virus that's sitting in this little dish. And this red dot is supposed to represent the virus. So you add a certain amount of sample, let the virus bind the antibody, wash everything else off, and then you have a second antibody. Well, let me just write this. This is um, another antibody specific to the virus, right? So these guys are all open to bind. These blue ones are binding the actual virus. And then you have a second antibody that has some kind of detection method. Okay, so usually color changing. So there's where the enzyme linked part is. Oops. Is there's usually an enzyme here that when you add a substrate to it, it changes color. Okay. And so the intensity of the color can tell you how much virus. So again, you use a dilution, or sometimes people call these titrations, right? But you're diluting out the virus, um, and you will use like a standard curve, right? So you'll say, okay, we know these colors equals this much virus. And then you ah, you do all your samples and you plot them on the curve and you can goodness gracious, figure out how much virus you have. Okay, so that's an ELISA. Even though it has my beautiful name Lisa, it's not Elisa, it's ELISA. <laughs> um, okay, this one um, is looking at genome numbers. So this one, you can imagine the ELISA is looking uh, binding to the capsid, the outside, or, or the glycoproteins, the outside of the virus. Plaque assay, um, I want to make a point, is calculating viable infectious, I shouldn't say viable, um, infectious units, okay? These plaques are made by a virus that can actually infect the cells and make more virus and infect the other ones. These are not quantitating infectious units. 
This is quantitating virus particles. Okay. So um, one of the, um, uh, what do you call it, lectures I talked about um, particle to plaque forming unit ratio. So you can have particles that are not infectious because of mutations, because they didn't capture the genome, because of some other error. We cannot tell infectious particles based on ELISA. We can just tell total virus particles. Okay, so if you have a virus that has a high particle to PFU ratio, this isn't going to really tell you how much infectious virus you have. And neither will PCR, RT-PCR, QPCR because you're calculating number of genomes okay, and it's not telling you whether that genome has mutations or not. So the way this works, PCR is a very common molecular tool and it's based on you have to know genome sequence, at least part of it, and you have these little fat arrows here called primers that are specific to the specific virus. Okay. And these primers will copy, 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 and PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. So it's based on DNA amplification. So you can determine how many genomes, approximately, the, the amount of virus genomes in a sample. Okay, like I said, you don't know if they're um, infectious or have mutations or whatever, but um, you can quantitate virus this way. It's very fast. It's very cheap. Um, so you will see this a lot in the papers we read. RT-PCR means you're looking at an RNA virus, which means you have to first reverse transcribe the RNA to DNA. So if you remember, transcription is DNA to RNA. RNA to DNA is reverse transcription because PCR only works on DNA. So if you're working with an RNA virus like influenza, you have to take an extra step to convert the RNA genome to DNA, and then you can do this amplification process. And all of this is done with qPCR, which means quantitative. And I'm not going to go into all, all the details of the techniques, but just understand that you can quantitate the number of genomes in a sample for both RNA and DNA viruses. Okay, so let's finish up with just a few slides about the immune response to a virus infection. And again, this is super general. Um, you will find different things for your specific um, viruses. But in general, your immune system has two types of response. The innate, which is more of the nonspecific, and the first acting. immunity, and the adaptive, which is our memory long-term. Okay. So here's showing you a timeline, about two weeks for a virus infection. And the main thing we're going to talk about is interferon molecules, because we haven't talked about those. Natural killer cells are also part of your innate immune response. And so this is happening in your first few days, right? You're getting this big spike in interferon production and uh, natural killer cells as the virus is increasing in number. So titer just means amount of virus. And then as we get into the adaptive, the memory blah, immune response, your immune response is starting to take control of this infection. So the amount of viruses going down, you have both <clears throat> antibodies made by B cells and cytotoxic T cells. 
and let's just take a look at that. So your innate, again, interferon we're going to talk about in a minute, natural killer cells, killing infected cells. But then what we really want, and this is where we talked about with vaccines and immunization, is we really want long-term adaptive immunity. So the B cells are now making antibodies that are specific to that virus. And they're going to protect against current infection, but also, more importantly, future infection. And here's your C, tel C, C, tels C T cells. That's why I was getting cytotoxic T cells that can actually bind to um, antigens on the cell surface and kill infected cells. And these are both going to be part of the memory. So this is what we're trying to do with vaccines, and this is what your body is naturally doing with a virus or bacterial or, or protozoa or fungal infection as well. So let's um, have a couple slides to talk about interferon. Interferon is a cytokine, which just means a cell signaling molecule. Um, interferons are modulators of the immune system. So they can be produced um, by a um, infected cell. And what's really cool is they can go to the neighboring cells and say, hey, viruses are coming. Kind of like, uh, who's that, Paul Revere? The British are coming, the British are coming. Okay, so interferons can warn... neighboring cells of the virus infection. They can also stimulate the immune system and say, hey, sometimes they say, hey, come and kill me. Um, I've been infected. Uh, <clears throat> so what's interesting, I think, about the interferon cell signaling is this ISG. And these are interferon and we're not going into all the details because I don't understand all the details. Interferon stimulated genes. So these are genes produced by the host cell, your cells. And the whole point is to combat a viral infection. So get it under um, control. And so this crazy slide is not anything you need to know, but I just want to show you that there are hundreds of interferon-stimulated genes um, that have effects um, as antivirals. And one of the big stimulators of interferons is double-stranded RNA. So RNA viruses have to replicate their RNA and there will be times that there's double stranded, so plus um, a positive sense and a negative sense RNA. If you think about all you've learned in, in general biology or cell biology or genetics about gene expression in um, eukaryotic cells, we don't make double stranded RNA, right? We go DNA, single stranded RNA to protein. So double stranded RNA is a huge, huge trigger for the interferon response. So if your virus is an RNA virus, I want you to look at, as you're writing your wiki, about how does it combat um, interferon. Um, a lot of viruses, and I know I talked about this in one of the lectures, I think the replication cycle, I talked about some kind of cool things. Some viruses will make these inclusion bodies, or they'll make these um, envelope, they'll steal envelopes, not envelopes, sorry, um, cell, they'll steal membranes from the cell and they'll make these little areas for the, the RNA to replicate, to hide it from the cell so that interferon isn't stimulated. Okay. Um, interferon, let me get rid of all this, oops, um, Oh, 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 continue. Sorry. 
go back. Okay. All I wanted to do was get rid of this ink. Okay. PKR. If you took cell biology, um, you know about some of these protein kinases. Um, PKR leads to a decrease in protein synthesis in the cell. So it's going to shut off the host cell protein synthesis as well as viral protein synthesis. Um, I'm looking to see if this guy is located. Um, RNase L is an enzyme that's turned on and it starts destroying all the RNA in the cytoplasm. So yes, it's turning off host cell protein synthesis, but it's kind of like this sacrifice, right? The good for the whole village. Um, I'm going to kill myself. Um, I'm going to stop my protein synthesis, so hopefully the virus can't spread to other cells. Um, there is an increase. I don't know if it's shown here. There's an increase in P53 activity, and this can lead to apoptosis. So again, the cell will self-destruct because it's infected. And um, one of the other major uh, uh, targets or results of interferon response is an increase in MHC1, MHC2. These are major histocompatibility complexes 1 and 2. And basically they present or show viral antigens on the outside of the cell. so that your immune response can come and, for instance, those um, cytotoxic T cells can kill the infected cell. Or T helper cells can increase cytokines to increase the immune response. So interferon is a very quick acting. Like I said, it's part of the innate immune system, so it's one of the first things that happens. Quick acting, not specific to any specific virus, but specific to virus infections in general, turns on all these genes, tries to shut down um, the spread of the virus. Of course, this is my final slide, viruses have developed ways to interfere with the interferon response, right? So you guys can take a look at this. I'm not going into all of this. Um, I don't even know what all these proteins are. But these are proteins important in um, interferon signaling, making interferon. And these are showing how viruses can stop some of this um, cell signaling to block or shut down the interferon response so that the virus can replicate, can make a productive infection. All right, so just a little bit for you to think about pathology, types of virus infections, and a little bit on the immune response to viruses. Thank you.